Hello everyone, this is Mike McDaniel, the Evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. We're glad to have you with us for our Wednesday evening devotional. We are once again in a snowstorm morning and uh, we are expecting more snow uh, on Wednesday. And this will probably prohibit us from meeting on Wednesday evening, so we hate that. It'll be two Wednesday nights in a row. But uh, we're doing this lesson on uh, Thursday, I'm sorry, Tuesday afternoon late in advance of the snowstorm that's coming. They say we could get another six inches. We probably already have. Uh, I have six or seven on the south side of my house. I have an 11 inch drift on the front uh, next to the front porch. We've got quite a bit, and we've got more coming, and of course we've got a layer of ice underneath all of that. I thought since our minds are on the snow, that I might speak about the treasures of the snow today. We're experiencing this prolonged time of ice and snow. It's different from what we are accustomed, and just getting out of our driveway can be a major feat. I slid out of my driveway. Uh, just a few minutes ago. One person related how he once used his seven-year-old son's baseball bat to smash the slick coat of ice on his driveway. Well, he got cold and he went inside for a cup of coffee before attempting to clear the car. And several minutes later, his... Uh, his son, his seven-year-old son, who had been outside with him, came in. Dad, he said, I got the ice off the car. How did you do that, his father asked. Same way you did, boy shrugged, with a baseball bat. <laughs> I would have hated to have been that father when he went back out to look at his car. God's one, God once said to Job in Job 38, 22, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Job was someone who experienced snow and knew what that was. In Job 12, 15, Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. The words dry up may refer to the waters above the firmament. In Genesis 1 and 7, that were established on the day of creation, we believe resulting in a greenhouse effect that made rain impossible in the primeval world. Genesis 2 and verse 5. This global water blanket, probably of water vapor, was withheld from the earth until God used it to overturn the earth in the days of Noah. And when the appointed time came, Noah came into the ark as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in, Genesis 7, 16. There was only one door for the ark, Genesis 6 and 16, and it could not be opened until the earth had been overturned by the great waters. Now, Job was a patriarch, he probably lived just prior to the time of Abraham. He would have lived in a world that was only recently recovered from the devastation of the Great Flood. The greenhouse environment would have dissipated. And I believe it's significant that there are more references to cold, snow, and ice, and frost in Job than in any other book of the Bible. And this week we've seen some of the prettiest snow that I have seen in a long time. So I thought it might be good today to consider the treasures of the snow. There are lessons that God would have us to learn from the snow. There are treasures in the snow that God would have us to see. So please discover with me the treasures of the snow. First of all, snow is a treasure. 
because of its provider. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Job 38, 22. The word treasure can also be translated as storehouse. Storehouse. It carries with it the idea of God storing up snow and dispensing it at his choosing. Sort of like Joseph in Egypt storing up the grain in the storehouses and then dispensing it in the time of famine. The hydrologic cycle is evidence of the existence of God and of the wisdom of his divine design. Looking back at Job 28, 25 through 27, he says to make the weight for the winds and he weigheth the waters by measure when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. Then did he see it and declare it. He prepared it, yea, and searched it out. Verse 26 is a pre-scientific statement. The study of water flows and forces is called hydrodynamics. And what Job is speaking specifically of here is what we call the hydrologic cycle. The weight of the winds controls the worldwide air mass movements that transport the waters evaporated from the oceans over the continents. And there the waters uh, evaporate and fall to, to the ground to water the earth. Now how is all of this accomplished? Well, we know that water weighs more than air. And the answer is that God turns the water into vapor by the sun. Vapor is lighter than air. So the winds then transport the waters from the ocean to the land where it's needed. And then under the right conditions, the vapor can condense around dust particles and finally, the water droplets join with others, and then they become so large that their weight is greater, and that causes them to fall to the ground as rain or snow. But what makes those small droplets become large enough to do that? Well, the answer there is in verse 26. He made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. With the right combination of air turbulence and clouds, the complex forces generate an electrical field that produces lightning, and these violent electrical currents in some way causes the small water droplets to bind together with others to form larger drops. And so I just think about what a, what a complex system God's designed for watering the earth after the flood. In Psalm 148 and 8, fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Scientists tell us that snowflakes are actually born in clouds containing moisture, and the conditions must be just right for this to take place. The temperature must be well below the freezing point of water, Tiny snow crystals are formed, and as they get heavier, they begin to fall, and as they fall, they get larger because they pick up more moisture in the atmosphere. God provided for all of that. And the same God that provided for all of that provides for his children too. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down, just like the snow, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Snow's a treasure because of its provider. Second of all, snow is a treasure because of its purity. Let's turn over to Job 9, 29 through 31. Job 9, 29 through 31. 
If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water, and make my hands never so clean, yet shall thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. Job challenges Bildad, If I am guilty as you say, why am I working so hard to prove my innocence? His accusers would not pronounce him innocent, even if he went through all the outward affirmations of innocency. If he washed his hands in innocence with snow water, yet he says they would still condemn him. Well, why in the world does he mention snow water? I guess because he couldn't think of anything so clean as snow water. You see, to Job, snow was a sign of purity. Now, it was to David as well. Turn to Psalm 51.7. Psalm 51.7. David says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. King David, Israel's most illustrious ruler, the man after God's own heart became a seducer, an adulterer, a liar, and a murderer. Israel's ruler was now ruled by sin, and a year had passed since David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and orchestrated the murder of her husband. And David had deteriorated. He had gone down physically and emotionally and spiritually. He was, his conscience was gnawing at him. At night he tossed and he turned. But then the noble Nathan gave him that parable and said, Thou art the man. His defense is dropped and he cried, I have sinned against the Lord. In 2 Samuel 12, 13, And Nathan said, based on that confession, his repentance, The Lord also hath put away your sin. Despite the devastating consequences that he endured for his sin, he was assured of God's forgiveness. And after realizing the extent of his sin and his consequences, it's believed that David penned Psalm 51, the song of repentance, a song of, of pleading for God's forgiveness. He said, I acknowledge my transgressions. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. God can restore and God can forgive us if we will only turn to him. When we confess our sins as David did there in Psalm 51, God will forgive us. God will restore us if we will only turn to him as David did there in that psalm. You know, when we confess our sins to God, we're washed as white as snow, and then he will send us out again his love and grace to show. Snow was also a sign of purity to Isaiah. Let's turn over to Isaiah 1 and verse 18. Isaiah 1 and 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. These two colors... Scarlet and crimson are used to refer to the deep dyed or the double dyed condition brought by sin. Even though the nations were deeply stained with sin, God promised that they shall become white as snow or white as wool, completely forgiven, completely cleansed. What's one of the most difficult stains to remove, ladies? Is it not blood stains? We might suggest that the most difficult stains to remove are really sin stains. They're of a deeper dye than simply blood stains. And sin stains have such a place in our hearts and consciences that nothing can remove them but the blood of Jesus Christ. The chorus of the song that we sing, Nothing But the Blood, says, 
Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And on the cross, the shed crimson blood canceled out the effects of our crimson stained sins in the sight of God. Only the precious Son of God could make that happen. Sin is a tra uh, snow is a treasure because of its purity. Number three, snow is a treasure because of its productivity. Let's look now at Job 38. In Job 38, 22 and 23, our sermon text, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? If any material thing gives evidence of God's handiwork, it's the snow. What are the treasures of the snow? Proverbs 25, 13, as the cold of snow in the time of harvest. So is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his masters. Hmm, snow in the time of harvest. Scientists tell us that snow picks up nitrogen in the air when it's formed and then dispenses it upon the earth as it melts thus aiding the productivity of the ground. Snow makes an impact. It has an influence. Job did not know. No modern man knew the treasures of the snow in regard to productivity until a Canadian chemist published the results of 17 years of research in the financial value of snow and hail. And in an issue of Science Service, he tabulated the following. Quote, washing out of atmosphere nitrogen substances that fertilize the soil, snow deposits four kinds of chemical fertilizer. Number one, free ammonia. Number two, nitrates. Number three, nitrites. And number four, albumoid ammonia. These substances add up to a value of $14 per acre dropped by winter snow and hail. Now those are, <laughs> those are old numbers. I'm sure they've increased astronomically like everything else. Nitrogen of air assimilated by plants as food is also something valuable, which it does, although we can't put a price on that. But, he says, add up the other four. Say, for instance, if a farmer has 10 acres, he received treasure of snow to a value of $140 in fertilizer. Figure out the number of acres of earth under cultivation in snow regions. Multiply the vast, stupendous treasure. Count the sum in money. Now God says in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Snow originates from God, is dispersed by him, and in order for our lives to really have purpose to be productive, it begins with a relationship with the Father based on the truth of God, based on the word of God. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then in John 15 and verse 4, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Snow is a treasure because of its productivity. And then finally, snow is a treasure because of its peculiarity. One of the most beautiful wonders of nature God has given us is the amazing variety of shapes of snow crystals that fall on the sky snow on a cold winter's night. I was watching those in our recent snowstorm. 
My, what big flakes there were, and they were so big you could see just a little bit of their intricacy. They are God's microscopic masterpieces. You probably heard that no two snowflakes are alike. Well, that's true. This discovery was made in the small rural town of Jericho, Vermont, by Wilson A. Bentley, who lived from 1865 to 1931. A self-educated farmer, Bentley attracted worldwide attention with his pioneering work in the area of photomicrography. Most notably, his extensive work with snow crystals, commonly known as snowflakes. By adapting a microscope to a bellows camera, and after years of trial and error, he became the first person to photograph a single snow crystal in the year 1885. He would go on to capture more than 5,000 snowflakes during his lifetime. In all that time, he never found any two alike. His snow crystal photographs were acquired by colleges and universities throughout the world, and he published many articles from magazines and journals, including Scientific American and National Geographic. In 1931, his book, Snow Crystals, containing more than 2,400 snow crystal images, was published by McGraw-Hill. On December the 23rd, 1931, Bentley died at his family farmhouse in Jericho, but because of his wonderful work with snow crystals, he had become affectionately known as Snowflake Bentley. Snowflake Bentley. He wrote the following. Under the microscope, I found that snowflakes were miracles of beauty, and it seemed a shame that this beauty should not be seen and appreciated by others. Every crystal was a masterpiece of design and no one design was ever repeated. When a snowflake melted, that design was forever lost. Just that much beauty was gone without leaving any record behind. You know, like snowflakes, people are unique too. We have similarities, but we each have distinct characteristics that separate us from everyone else. Our fingerprints are unique. Our footprints are unique. The pattern of even our eyeballs are unique from anyone else's. What does that say about God and us? Like snow, we too have a designer. We're a thing of value. We are special. And we've been designed for a purpose, like the snowflake. You know, I learned something about snowflakes this week that I did not know before. And I'm always excited to learn new things. On Monday night, I looked out the window at 11 o'clock at night, and some of the snow in the front yard was sparkly, like glitter. I mean, it looked like diamonds in the snow. And the next morning, I I began to read about it, and and one scientist agreed with Martha's assessment that it it resembled uh, Tinkerbell's pixie dust. I saw the, the same thing when the sun was shining on it the next morning. So I began to research this phenomenon and I learned that flat snowflakes resting on top of a blanket of snow can act like a mirror reflecting the light of the sun or as it was the night before of a street light towards your eye. And this is called Snow sparkle. Snow sparkle. Much of our snow here is wetter because it's usually closer to 32 degrees in freezing mark when it snows here. However, when precipitation falls into the air where temperatures at the surface and aloft are very cold, like from 8 to 15 degrees, such as we just had, The result is a dry snow, 
I told Martha, this is a this is like powder. I mean, this is like they have in Colorado. And then I heard a weatherman say exactly the same thing when he compared it to the kind of snow they have in Colorado. It's a dry snow, and when you have a dry snow, a fine powder like that, good for skiing, but not good for making snowmen because it's not wet and it's not sneaky, sticky. Well, those snowflakes are more plate-like. They're more flat, and they're easier to reflect light. So, so the dry snow has a reflective prism effect. And that's what gives it that glittery quality here and here and here and here in the snow. My, how pretty it is. You know, I think of Matthew 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As Christians, we've got to reflect the light of the world, Jesus Christ in our lives, in a world that's filled with darkness. Just like those little beautiful snowflakes reflected the light of the street light in the dark in an amazing way to me. What a joy it is to reflect upon the treasures of the snow. They cause us to reflect upon our wonderful Heavenly Father who provides for us, upon the purity of that God expects of us, and the productivity that he desires of us, and then the peculiarity of each of us to fulfill the purposes of Almighty God. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for the treasures of the snow and thankful that we have learned so much about the snow and can glean from this information also applications to our own lives. We're so thankful, Father, for thy divine design in our lives. And we're thankful, Father, that we can shine the light of Christ in our community and others. Help us to be the kind of influence that thou wouldst have us to be. Help us to live lives of purity and productivity. And we're thankful, Father, for thy providence and for the provision that thou continues to make for us. Bless us and forgive us from our wrongs, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I really hope, and we couldn't do it last week, but I hope to see you this Sunday for worshiping to our God and until then. Have a great day.